So we have talked much already about interpretation, like running a program. And for example, we have also um, exercise denotational style of semantics to get interpreters or the operational style. Um, so here we want to kind of add a form of interpretation, usually referred to as abstract interpretation, that allows you to compute properties of the program rather than actually execute or evaluate the program. So for this to make sense here, I assume that you had a coverage of basics of interpretation and denotational semantics as we rely on these subjects in what follows. Okay, so simple motivation for abstract interpretation. Look at this simple imperative program here, completely silly, but enough to make the point. Without knowing the value of x, so x might be even a program variable that might be part of the input that we only provide if we actually run the program for real. So without knowing the value of x, nevertheless, we know for sure that the value of y at this point must be positive. I mean, just by basic reasoning, basic arithmetics, we know it must be positive here. Because it's positive, uh, we never actually need to do this test. And so we can already save on the test. Additionally, we, we don't really need this code. We should emit a warning. This code will never be executed. So depending on how you look at it, it's either an optimization or maybe uh, something we, we should warn about. And so we basically want to understand how we can write some form of interpreter, an abstract interpreter, that gives us this information here, namely that uh, y is positive at that point. And then once we know these things, we can, we can easily implement optimizations or warnings. Okay, so the key idea here is when we when we do abstract interpretation is that we kind of no longer plan to operate on actual values as we, as we know them, like ints and booleans. Um, rather, we operate on abstract values. So for example, for the problem that we just looked into, it may be enough to operate on signs rather than actual ints. So, and again, for the problem we just looked at, regardless of the value, regardless of the sign of x, y would be positive at the appropriate point in the program. So here are just some examples of uh, operations that we would typically just use uh, on numbers, but now we kind of uh, define them instead on signs. And all these rules are pretty straightforward. Like, assume like we multiply two negative numbers, we get a positive number. Uh, if you multiply negative and positive, we get negative. And here we also add uh, a question mark because sometimes we simply don't know. Okay? So if you don't know the sign, uh, then in many cases, we also don't know the result, uh, except maybe here for zero, we, we know that it's always zero, okay? And similarly, we can uh, apply this trick to pretty much any operation that a normal operator would involve. Um, and in this manner, we, we can imagine how the normal interpreter uh, becomes more abstract um, in computing on properties rather than actual values, okay? So in order to make this step from a, let's say, concrete interpreter to an abstract interpreter, here is um, a simple concrete interpreter again for the imperative language. And we want to somehow factor it so that it's clear what part of interpretation 
is shared among concrete versus abstract interpretation. And uh, let's just recall how this interpreter is structured, right? So essentially here we have this compositional scheme, how we essentially traverse over all the statement forms and uh, we invoke recursion on all the substatements. And then when once we have determined all the meanings of sub-expressions and substatements, we we have some operator um, uh, that defines the meaning uh, as it is composed from the constituents. Okay, and here are all the helper functions, all the operators that indeed assign meaning uh, or compose meanings, if you like. This, this was the denotational style of interpretation, and we're going to rely on this style as far as abstract interpretation is concerned. Um, so remember, like, you know, the semantics of uh, skip is the identity function. For assignment, essentially, we just manipulate um, verbal assignments. Um, sequential composition of statements, we use um, function composition. And for uh, if statement, we essentially also use a conditional within the uh, functional language here. And for while, we need to compute an appropriate fixed point, uh, if you remember. Now, how can we extract uh, the common structure uh, for both a concrete versus an abstract interpreter? Well, the trick is um, the actual definitions here of all these functions, they are specific to the kind of interpreter we need. But the fact that we need such members at all, uh, that's, that's a general fact. So what we do here is we imagine that we build an algebra, um, think record, of all these ingredients here, and that we parameterize this compositional and recursive scheme by this algebra. So rather than hardwiring specific choices here, um, we group, we prepare to group up such specific choices in an algebra, as we say, uh, in Haskell as a record, and we pass this record to this function, and by this we have a large amount of reuse. So here's the type of these semantic algebras, kind of a record type that we need. So first of all, um, we, we assume that we need some sort of store transformation without committing to any particular representation of stores. So this is a type variable. We also assume because of expression evaluation, that we have some form of, like you could say, um, store observation. And also we don't really commit to any particular representation for values here, because we want to, uh, we want to use this for both abstract and concrete interpretation. And then we rely on these type synonyms within this record type. And you see we have a skip and a sign, a seek, a if, etc. So we basically have uh, record components that correspond to the operators that we need in filling in the details of composing meanings in an interpreter. And all these guys have the appropriate types. So for example, seek uh, prime uh, takes a store transformation and another store transformation and returns a store transformation. Okay, so this um, data type this record type provides the structure of the kind of ingredients that we need in order to commit to a particular interpreter, in fact, to a particular representation for all the involved types and particular um, the definitions of the operators for composing the meanings. Okay, now here is the parameterized uh, interpreter. So we have this additional argument here. So we receive a semantic algebra, which is still fully polymorphic. So we don't really commit to any particular store representation or value representation. 
And then here, this code is very similar to what we had before, except that it always picks up the appropriate operator from the semantic algebra A, right? So it's the same style of recursion into the statements, into the expressions, uh, but whenever we need to combine uh, the, um, the ingredients, we use the operators as we can essentially um, access them within the semantic algebra A. So this is now a fully parametrized interpreter. It pro accordingly, we should now go and instantiate this interpreter to basically go back to our standard interpreter. And then once we have achieved this, we can try to build a different abstract interpreter that uh, computes the properties of interest, such as signs, rather than uh, concrete values here. Okay, our standard interpreter values are either in the bool, uh, the stores are just maps of verbal identifiers uh, to values, and the algebra that we need here is then indeed um, we instantiate the polymorphic algebra type with store and value. And here we just repeat all the definitions that we simply extracted from the original monolithic, if you like, standard interpreter. So these are, these are just the same definitions of seek and if and while that we have seen previously, um, except that they are now grouped up here really as an algebra so that we can pass this algebra to the parametrized interpreter function and thereby we get back our standard interpreter. Okay, so now let's imagine how we instead set up an abstract interpreter which operates on science essentially or computes uh, science as properties instead of ins and booleans. And to this end, we basically replace uh, those concrete domains that we talked about previously by these domains. So rather than talking about int, we will be talking about sign. And what is a sign? Well, it's a zero, pos, and neck. Uh, there's nothing surprising about it. And there are now two additional elements here, bottom and top. So we will see this in a second, um, but the intuition is, um, as we will be doing some sort of iterative uh, fixed point computation, button will serve a special role in uh, helping us to start the uh, fixed point computation from basically undefined, whereas top is indication of uh, error in the sense uh, like we were not able to compute any useful property. So basically it means uh, we could have any sign here and we are really stuck. So we replace booleans by CPU, CPO bool, so CPO uh, stands for complete partial order. This, this is hinting at the kind of algebraic structure that we need here for the kind of fixed point computation uh, to be possible. So, but it's, if you like, it's basically uh, just a richer version of bool. So it's either a proper bool or we also have a button and the top for, for booleans. Okay. And then property replaces value. So property is not either int bool, it's rather either sign CPU bool. Well, and then more properties replaces store. So it's also a map and it's also a map from verbal identifiers, but we don't map to values, we map to properties. Okay, so this is how we prepare our abstract interpreter in terms of the types um, that the interpreter operates on. Now, just a fun fact here, um, we can clarify that science, uh, they are essentially really 
abstract numbers. And there are some, there's some formal reason behind here, um, skip over here, but I, I give you a very simple constructive argument here. We just instantiate the num class of Haskell with sign. Uh, in, in this way, we, we sort of show that um, sign is something like a number, just as much as int is a number. And then you remember the tables for these operations that I showed earlier on in this presentation. Uh, we can capture them here as the operations of num, right? So here are here, for example, we uh, point out how addition works, and you see that whenever uh, top and bottom are involved, this will basically define. The result. So think of this like this. If we if we already cannot hope for one of the operands to have a more specific sign, but we assume it could be any sign, well then we will not be able to assign a specific sign to the result. And here, if if we are kind of again imagine fixed point computation. If we don't know yet anything about um, the sign of either side, then we also don't know yet the sign of the result. Well, if we add 0 and 0, it's 0. If we add 0 and POS, it's positive, and so on. Now, I was mentioning already the fact that we need these buttons and tops. So bottom being basically the undefined value and top being the overdefined value. And we need to arrange uh, all the proper values or signs um, uh, together with the bottom and the top element in an appropriate uh, structure. So it's a complete partial order. Um, so essentially we want some sort of partial order uh, function and also least upper bound. Um, and in this way, we can later on perform the appropriate fixed point uh, computation in the abstract interpreter in a way similar to how we have performed fixed point computation in the denotational interpreter. Okay, partial ordering. So if X and Y are equal, they are also partially ordered. Um, bottom is really smaller than anything else. Um, and anything is smaller than top. Um, otherwise, for, for signs, we don't have any other true order relationships. So for example, zero is not smaller than pos, pos is not smaller than neck, and so on. So therefore, we have a catch-all case here with false. The least upper bound of two values is x, if they are the same. And um, obviously, if bottom is on either side, then the least upper bound is the other value. And if we have any other combination of values, so for example, we have the combination of pos and neck, then we get to top sign, which means we don't know. Okay. And um, yeah, this is also how we explicitly uh, tell the type system here that we have a bottom, but that's a bit of a coding detail. Just to clarify, um, the kind of complete partial order that we use here can also be visualized by a Hasse diagram like this. So this is bottom, this is top. And so we have like three distinct elements here, next zero pos. And bottom is smaller than all of these elements. And all of these elements are smaller than top. And we, we actually opted for this model of signs here. You could also argue that we might want to add a bit more precision. Uh, you, you could have additional elements here like non-pos and non-neck, 
Uh, this would, would allow us to uh, define more least upper bounds without going right away to top. And more generally, when you do abstract interpretation, you always have some choice in how you set up your abstract domains, basically how big these abstract domains are. Obviously, the bigger the domains are, maybe the more precision you can expect, but maybe also the computations are getting very expensive. So there's always a trade-off. Okay, now, here is our algebra for sign detection. And uh, you, you might need to put down some time to understand this in detail, so I will just run through it quickly to provide some intuitions here. But this is quite a beast, obviously. But some, some parts are easy. So here we just uh, kind of repeat some of the type synonyms that we rely on. So we have our abstract values, that is properties. We have our abstract stores, that is bar properties. <clears throat> and here we build our algebra. And essentially we build an algebra that is somewhat close to the algebra for the standard interpreter. So for example, skip is defined by ID just as in the standard interpreter. And also the treatment of assignments is, is the very same, uh, with the only difference of course that we manipulate different kinds of stores here, but the shape of it in here is the same as in the standard interpreter. And that's also true for sequential composition of statements. We apply function composition just as before. So there's apparently nothing really that we can or must abstract from here. Uh, things start to be different for if. So for if, what we do is, we obviously receive something that corresponds to the condition and something G and H, they correspond to the Zen and the else branch. Now, what we do here is we look at the meaning of the condition. So we apply it to the given store, the abstract store, and we insist that we get back an abstract bool. We, we certainly don't want to get a sign here, so here we just insist it's an abstract bool. Now we perform a case discrimination on that abstract bool, and it could be a true, it could be a false, it could also be a bottom and a top. So, if we somehow know that the condition will evaluate the true, then the meaning of the if statement is solely defined in terms of the meaning of the then branch. Likewise for false, we defer to the else branch. But now it could be that we don't really know yet what the value of the condition is. Because remember, we and we see this in a second here, this is where the fixed point computation kicks in. So if we start from bottoms with some fixed point computation to carry out interpretation, initially, maybe also this condition will evaluate to bottom. And if this is the case, the meaning, the composed meaning of the if statement will also be bottom. So, which means we probably need to continue fixed point computation to obtain um, meaningful results here. But it may also be the case that we have already figured out that the condition could evaluate to both true and false, and this is what the top rule case is for. If the condition can evaluate to both Boolean results, then this means we need to combine the meaning of the then and the else branches. And this is where we use least upper bound. And this is quite a nasty bit here. Uh, we are combining essentially the, the abstract stores here, right? We say whatever the Zen branch could, could compute or the else branch 
that sort of abstract store needs to be combined and that store then models what could be the result of the uh, if statement, okay? So now here it gets a bit tricky and don't expect to get this just from my very brief explanation. Okay, but the essence of it is as follows. F is the meaning of the condition of the while statement. G is the meaning of the body of the while statement. And then we somehow compute a fixed point over it where we involve if and skip and we compose the assumed meaning of the while statement x with the meaning of the body. So in a way this is very very similar to the standard interpreter except that we use a different fixed point operator here and that we initiate the fixed point computation um, in a special way starting from bottom. So we will look at this a bit more in detail on the next slide, but the key thing to understand here is, yes, we perform a very similar fixed point computation uh, for a while statement here, because the, the, the meaning of a while statement needs to be defined by a fixed point, except that we will perform uh, a fixed point computation on, on these um, complete partial orders and we will start fixed point computation from the buttons. Okay, and then this stuff here is again very similar to, to what we had in the standard interpreter. We just um, operate on, on different, that is abstract domains, but other than that it's pretty much the same. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at this uh, problem of fixed point computation. So remember, this is the kind of fixed point operator that we used in the standard denotational interpreter. Um, it's essentially defined by the fixed point condition. Yes, so basically for uh, the fixed point of F is such that if we apply F to the fixed point, well, that's again the fixed point. So now, and this is in a way, this is another very computational approach. I mean, here we really rely on the on the meaning of the the body of the while loop to essentially um, at some point um, have a base case so that we terminate this infinite recursion. For the abstract interpretation, we really want to make sure that we that we terminate. I mean, we want to terminate with a result of the analysis. We don't want it to just suddenly uh, analyze forever. So we use a different way of computing fixed points. So essentially, what we do here is we also um, apply a given function, it's called h, to some initial value, think of this as button, and we apply it any number of times. So basically, iterate hi produces a list of applications of h to i, and for each element it's an, it's an uh, increasing number of applications. So it's first i, then it's h i, then it's h h i, and so on. And this, in our case, this is something like the store here, let's say. So, and then what limit does is it basically looks at the prefix of this infinite list, and we're on a lazy language, so we never materialize this infinite list. It looks at the prefix at the first two elements. Um, and if they are the same, we have reached a fixed point. And if not, we just keep on looking by this recursion with limit. And this fixed point exists if we have constructed our abstract interpretation in a sound manner. And I'm not going to be very clear about the constraints that we have to meet. But essentially, it requires that 
obviously we need to be able to work on uh, complete partial orders here and need to be able to start from bottom. But also all these functions here, they need to uh, meet additional conditions. So, and if we construct the system in such a sound manner, then this computation will also terminate. I realize that this is not quite obvious and um, you obviously have to play with this in order to get a good understanding of it. Anyway, so we now have our abstract interpreter for sign detection. Let's put it to work. So here are two variations of a um, program for computing factorials. So it basically, y should be the factorial of x. And I'm just putting two variations here just to pinpoint some challenge. Um, because our sign detection may more easily be useful for either of these variations. What's the difference here? Well, here um, we use an extra uh, loop variable i, which we basically increment until we hit x. And here we basically use x and we decrement it down in a certain way. So this is, this is the difference between these two variations. And as we will see, um, our sign detection algebra, as we defined it so far, uh, that's the upper one, works fine for the first variation of factorial, but has some issues with the second variation. So let's look at this. So what do we do here? We take this uh, function uh, for factorial, and we feed some assumptions into the analysis that is we assume that x is positive so we want to compute factorial of a positive number x um, sign detection by abstract interpretation gives us some properties for the variables that are involved in a program in particular it figures out that y which is the result that we're interested in is going to be positive. It also figures out that i and x are positive at the end of the program. I mean, that's nice to know, but maybe we were not interested in that. Now we apply the same abstract interpretation to the other variation of factorial, where we don't actually have a verbal i, but instead where we count down x. And surprise, surprise, uh, abstract interpretation fails here to figure out the right property for y. So what it does is it assigns top to y, which means it really doesn't know what sign uh, y is going to have um, at the end of the program. So it could be positive, it could be negative, it could be zero in fact. So this is not so great. And you can look at the algebra and it's discussed at length in the book. Basically, we can apply a simple trick to become a little bit more nuanced about how we handle if statements, because remember, there was the problem that we would quite easily end up combining Zen and else branches in a way that this could easily lead to top. And there's a more clever way of doing this not going into it here, but indeed this more clever analysis will still figure out that y is positive. Great. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So we basically uh, looked at interpretation in the style of denotational semantics. We kind of factored out the compositional scheme and the typing structure underlying it so that we could parameterize interpretation and semantic algebras. And then we could either use a concrete semantic algebra and get back to standard interpretation, or we could set up an abstract algebra that would instead um, involve properties of interest. And our example was science. And by this, we could compute properties of the program. Yeah, so all the code that I discussed here is, of course, available in the, in the repo.
and there's also additional metaprogramming techniques other than abstract interpretations covered in the book. Thanks.